All right, everybody, uh, welcome to the episode one of the Photographer's Underground podcast. I'm Jonathan Corbett, and today I have a college student who has 14,000 followers on Instagram. He started his business when he was very young. He's already shot several one-on-one, excuse me, uh, one-of-one exotic cars. He is an accomplished automotive photographer, well-known throughout the state of North Carolina, admired by many. And he hasn't even graduated college yet. So, with pleasure, I'm proud to introduce James well, Stevens. I'm excited to be here. I will say the uh, six years in college sort of extends my yeah my uh, buffer there a little bit. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead and uh, with these mics, I have to get really close. I got you real close. Yeah, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm really happy to have you as the first guest on the Photographers Underground podcast. Yeah, I'm excited. So uh, just to give a quick introduction of the podcast, what I try to do with all of this is uh, essentially I've been a photographer for about a decade now, full time. I've achieved some success of my own. But one thing I really don't see out there that I wanted to contribute to is videos out there on how to actually accomplish your goals within your photography business. There's plenty of tutorials and I guess influencers out there who are telling people how to do photography and some people telling you how to do run a photography business, but none of them have ever run a photography business themselves. They've run YouTube channels or they've run podcasts. And if they did run a business it was only for a very short time before they switched over to something else. Um, so we're going to introduce and interview and speak with a lot of people who are not well known but are successful uh, or finding their way to success to help people out there who want to do the same anyway so sorry for that I won't do it every time but oh, uh, that's just to get everyone on the page since hopefully this will be the first time listening to anything yeah yeah episode one so anyway uh, tell us how you got started in photography and I would love to hear about you know the first time you ever picked up a camera kind of get started on yeah. it and then I'll take us all the way to 2020. Yeah. So, um, my first experience with photography, my, uh, older brother, I got two brothers we're all two years apart. And my older brother, uh, had just gotten one of those just little point and shoot cameras yep. and he hardly used it. Um, he went around and clicked it here and there. And one day we had this, uh, like cocoon for a butterfly or something that was hanging from the mailbox. My mom told me to get a picture. That was the only camera I could find. So I grabbed it and figuring out just by trial and error, if I zoomed all the way in from further back, I could get blur in the background instead of okay. being all up close. Smart. I got one shot like that and was just sort of hooked and thought I was a photographer <laughs> with a little bit of bokeh. But um, right. I immediately asked for my uh, Christmas present to be a camera that year and I got a similar just tiny point and shoot. Um, just sort of messed around shooting trees and bugs and uh, my little brother skateboarding and my friends, things like that. Uh, eventually got into my first DSLR, a, well, that was a T3i, Canon T3i okay. Rebel. Um, and I had that for a really long time. Um, maybe a year into that DSLR was when I got into cars. I had never been into cars for the first maybe two, three years. I was Did you like photos. cars yourself at all or? Um, prior, no. Okay. I had just, just started getting into cars. Um, it was a brand new hobby for me. I had just gone to my first cars and coffee uh, locally and thought it'd be fun to take some photos of cars. So that's what I started doing was just bringing my little uh, Canon Rebel to car shows, taking photos with badges up close and anything I could. Um, How old were you when you do this? 12, 13-ish. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very impressive. Wow. Um, oh, I was getting driven there and dropped off by my mom or she sat in the parking lot drinking right. coffee while Make I walked sure around the car kidnapped. show. Yeah. But um, then my next door neighbor at the time, who was uh, a couple years older than uh, both me and my brothers, he had started a, a diesel truck group. And it was like three or four trucks at the time. They would go to the Kroger parking lot when they were open and call that a meet. But he saw a few of my uh, cars and coffee photos. And he walked over one day and said, hey, you want to come take photos of me and my buddy's trucks? And that was sort of my first private gig of sorts. Um, obviously I was still 14, whatever, and just got picked up by them and they didn't pay me or anything, but that was my first time ever getting to set a car aside and just take photos of a vehicle. Um, and since then it's just 
progressed and progressed and progressed. The more I got into cars, the more I sort of dove into the photography of it. So that was when you were 12, and you're how old now? Uh, 20, oh God, 24. 24, wow, so yeah. it's been like a solid 12 years, and obviously uh, this whole time you haven't been necessarily professional, you're just a hobbyist. Of course, yeah. Uh, and lots of times people, like you were saying, uh, you get one good shot, and then you start thinking, ooh, maybe I'm professional. Yeah. Uh, some people will dog Especially on that, but that's 10. exactly how all of us started. I mean, how else are you supposed to start? There's nothing wrong with that, you know? I mean, oh, you, you go, almost, you take a shot, you think it's pretty good, then you're like, well, maybe I should. do more. Almost anything. Yeah. You strum a guitar right one time, you want right. to pick up guitar or anything, yeah. So a lot of people knock on that. Uh, I hear a lot of professionals say, oh, everyone with a camera thinks they're professional, but, uh, and that's certainly not true, but... Uh, Let's be honest, professionals were there at that point. Exactly. All professionals at some point. were there at some point. Um, so not to try to be uh, an elitist or anything <laughs> else like that. Um, so tell us about your experience growing your business. Uh, I know that you reached out to me about a year ago because you were studying entrepreneurship at a local college here. Yeah. And you're looking for someone to work under. Yeah. And obviously since then we have worked, started working together. Uh, you're the first person I ever actually considered bringing on because <laughs> I get a lot of quirky emails from people who uh, think they want to be professional uh, or sometimes just people who want to learn what I do and then yeah. take off. Yeah. But uh, you definitely had talent. I've had lots of I appreciate that. people reach out to me. You're uh, definitely the only person I really consider. And I'm so glad that uh, you joined. But uh, how did you get from being, you know, shooting – just pictures of cars and coffee uh, and working with your neighbor to yeah. being recognized, you know, online, locally in the car. Yeah. It seems like everyone knows who JSP Auto is. By the way, what's, what's your Instagram tag? J JSP underscore auto. Okay. James Stevens photography. And you also auto. get, uh, you're getting into FPV as well, right? Yeah. FPV drones is a new hobby okay. of mine. And what's your Instagram for that? JSP FPV. Okay. Underscore? Yep. Okay. Yep. I stick with that. And uh, that one's new, but how many how many subscribers you got there? Or uh, A couple hundred, four or five hundred okay. maybe. Yeah. Right. My Instagram only has 400 followers. <laughs> 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 but um all right so tell us what it's like to be JSP Auto right now uh because obviously you're still a college student but yeah. you're doing what hundreds of photographers in North Carolina would love to do yeah can you give them a look at what your life is actually like as far <laughs> as dealing with clients um <laughs> The good side where, you, you know, you have a cool shoot, you have oh, a great yeah. client, you have someone who's fun to working with, but also the other side where you get a lot of people who don't show up yeah, or yeah. you just fill it in from there. Well, it's a, uh, I will say there's something about the modern day and age where you get a, a K next to your name and people immediately. What's a K? Like past 10 K on Instagram. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, once, once, once okay. you pass anything over 9,000, you get a K next to your name. But, uh. It, it's it's a ton of fun. I get to do some really cool stuff. I won't say it's as glamorous as some people necessarily think it is. Some right. people that I haven't met before but know my Instagram will come up to me at a car show and they assume I'm flying to New York and California and Florida and shooting supercars 24-7 all day for a living type thing, which it's, it's not necessarily that. I get to do some cool stuff, um, some cool foreign exotics, things like that. But... Um, really it's just a it's, it's just a really fun thing i love cars so much every single one is so unique everyone builds them so differently uh getting to go out and like capture all of those details is just a ton of fun um, okay and uh tell us about a few times where uh like some of the best experiences you've had shooting uh some of the worst experiences you've had shooting oh, yeah. yeah and also what your average shoot is like because um a lot of people in fact when you met me if you don't mind me saying this you said hey um i'm studying entrepreneurship um and when you interviewed you said you know i really enjoy what i do but as i'm getting older and as i'm getting close to graduating i'm realizing that the real world requires a lot more than maybe what yeah. the auto photography industry can exactly can give yeah so you're thinking about uh doing weddings or you're thinking about 
I mean, you were still holding an option on the table where you weren't going to do photography. You're going to just go oh, into something completely absolutely. different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so tell us what, why that was so like, um, well, first of all, best experience, worst experience, and then the realities. Uh, all right. Uh, all. Best experience. So there's a few things. I mean, some of the more recent stuff, best experience just sort of comes down to a really, really cool car. Um, right. Getting to shoot uh, recently, a few months ago, I shot a, a an original 1966 Ford GT um, built by the, the only company that's certified to still work on Ford GTs and keep original chassis numbers. They're the people who manufactured all the cars for Ford versus Ferrari. So stuff like that's really cool. Um, there's other just sort of fond memories I have uh, that I think are cool and fun. One of my first real high-end shoots was a... Uh, SLS AMG Black Series, a Mercedes SLS AMG Black Series, and it was the first one shipped to the United States. Um, and I had met the owner at Cars and Coffee and shot another one of his cars, and uh, he was impressed with my photos and asked me to shoot the unveiling photos for his event. I was still 15, and I couldn't drive. So <laughs> right. I went and got dropped off at this man's party with maybe 20, 25 of his closest friends, very private and exclusive by my mom and her Honda Odyssey uh. <laughs> and was just running around clicking photos. So uh, yeah. there's been some cool stuff like that. Um, worst experience. I was not having cool experiences like that when I was 15. <laughs> that was a ton of fun. Um, worst experiences. Let's make sure you keep close to the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they come in a variety of, of things. I mean, you get bad clients. Um, I've had people who just pester you for a shoot they want to shoot so bad so bad so bad you finally lock in a time they want you to drive two hours to their hometown to shoot some location they know you get there and then boom all contact stops they don't answer any texts anything on instagram no mm, phone calls just ghost you nothing yeah um it's happened more than once uh that i mean obviously trial and error leads me to things to forming things like requiring a deposit when someone sets a shoot but uh plenty of those things have happened there's also um instances of trying to find a location to shoot um and so i use google maps before a shoot and i just scan i try and match every car to a location that sort of fits it um if it's an old classic car i don't want it to be in some clean modern thing it would be a grungy more industrial area right things like that and so i'll scan google maps i'll find something that's really good um i always go scope it out first if i can sometimes out of town i can't and i'm showing up with the client and the whole thing's just been leveled there's just an apartment complex there now <laughs> or it just doesn't exist anymore um and so oh, I, man. I always try and find backup spots but there's right. definitely a few last minute scrambles and uh, on the topic of location, sometimes you'll be at a location and something bad happens because of the location. I've been chased out of spots, very angry, homeless people. And um, I, I you feel like it's relatively... You told me a story where you actually stepped in someone's... That's where I was going, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I have <laughs> stepped in human feces during a photo shoot. Um, <laughs> I, I bet it was a good location, though. I, I, it was a pretty good location. Well, yeah. um, I put that more up to the town we were in uh, at the time. It's not a great town. Should we throw shade at a certain town? We, Which town we, was I it? mean, it's our hometown. It's, it's, uh. it's Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> but we were uh, behind. It was this. It was a pretty good location. It was yeah. like a uh, abandoned building down this hill with some railroad tracks that had a bridge going over it. There was a big puddle, so I had the car parked where you got a reflection yeah. of the car. You could see the bridge in the background. Um, obviously there were homeless people that stayed around the area. They weren't there. We were shooting at maybe two in the afternoon. Um, but I was just walking around taking my shots and there was this sort of like pile of trash debris, sort of like old building materials, definitely a few clothes here and there. But, um, I couldn't get far back enough for the shot I wanted. And I figured I just, I'd sort of walk up that a little bit, maybe get a little bit of a cool angle. And I stepped in, I guess it was, it was on a t-shirt and it just, my foot like squished down and yeah, it, <laughs> my, my shoe got pretty covered and, and some human feet. Did you have some nice shoes there. or like, were they like Jordans? Uh, they, were, they were just some sneakers, but okay. that was the, that was the first spot of a two location shoot. And I just left my shoes there. I finished the shoot with barefoot. I mean, 
if I step in, step in some dog poop or something, I'll try and clean it off and put it in the trunk. But if I step in another man's, uh. another man's <laughs> crap, I'm, those shoes are gone. So that's a really good example between best experiences and worst experiences. Golly, yeah. you're yeah. lucky you don't step in anything dangerous either. You get yourself cut or prepped. Uh, or... You always got to be careful. I had my this uh, last week and I was shooting in Myrtle Beach and I had my camera bag on and I was holding my camera and I was walking out on a dock shooting a car that had pulled up to the water and my entire loop of my shoelace caught in one of the boat ties. Okay, I thought you were going to say someone tried to steal your stuff. Oh, no. Well, possible there too. But um, yeah, that tripped me up and I was I was pretty close to going myself, full equipment, everything <laughs> into the water. Gosh, dude. But, um, um, you just got back from Mustang week too, yeah, right? that's what that was. So that Mustang was pretty wild. You shot Beach. how many shoots in like three days? It was 13... 13 book shoots in three days. Yeah, Goodness. That, was, that, was busy. that is what I'm talking about. Um, well done. And uh, I mean, when I got started too in photography, I the first the first photo shoot I ever kind of ever did that I was kind of trying to take seriously uh, was shooting my own car. Um, shooting shooting automobiles is not easy. Uh, so, <sighs> and you, your Photoshop skills are second to none. Either. <laughs> I appreciate like, it. It's, uh, not only your technical ability to do the thing you're thinking of, but the things you think of to do are super creative. Uh, yeah. It's a, uh, I, people ask me about it a lot and I get a lot of DMS about train me how to shoot like you or teach me how to edit like you. And no chance. <laughs> I, I not even that I never had any sort of formal training. It's everything that I do is just things that I have picked up over the years of what looks better and what doesn't and what photos do better it's and the best what doesn't way to learn. and exactly and so that's my only answer to people now is when they ask for tips is I say just go go try just go yeah. play with stuff that's the best thing to do um you know I have no technically formal training myself yeah, even though I've uh you know got a success for myself but uh th I have since then you know bought some training courses or gone to some like workshops and at all these places you know they'll, they'll show you a few things but everybody the best teachers always tell people to just go out shoot yep just go out and that's try it. that's all you can um do. so some people think you know there's some special youtuber they haven't found or uh somebody that you subscribe to or some camera yeah some piece of gear that that, that once they figure out if they're just gonna all of a sudden it's, it's nothing yep. it's none of that i mean uh, do you remember i don't there's some really big youtube channel he's the he was the guy with the the big fluffy black hair that had the i shoot raw oh uh um jared poland jared fro knows yep yeah, fro knows photo, photo there, dot there. Com. that was the uh only sort of i guess training i ever yeah. had and super really branding, and, and great branding really the uh the only training i got from it sort of just led to the same thing right before i got my first dslr i had started watching some of his videos and i heard him i i don't know if i want to say crap on but he sort of put down shooting in anything other than manual and so before i got my first dslr in I knew I was like I, I have to shoot manual. Like I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna be caught shooting anything else <laughs> and shooting in raw. And right. so I wish I could find it, but I took a little notebook and I filled out seven or eight pages of notes off of his videos of how to shoot manual. And then once mm. my camera came in, I did nothing but play with it from there. I didn't watch any sort I mean, of cameras are super fun to play with. Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. You just shoot the same shot, but change every single setting and see what it looks like. And yep, you learn. Um. All right, so tell us, you know, about a year ago, I think things have changed a lot for you, actually, in the last year you've been working with me, and um, I don't know, I didn't really teach you anything, but just seeing me able to work, and also, uh, I don't know, I, I guess I'm a little bit stricter, a little bit meaner with um, the way I approach business, I don't know. Um, take us from before a year ago to the last year. Uh, what are some common experiences you had and then um, some things you've changed that have really helped? Because you said in the last year, things have gotten even better than they, than they were. Yeah. Um, I've just really, I think, and I mean, thanks to you a lot, I've sort of approached stuff with as much business mindset um, as I can, just in every aspect possible, mm. which has definitely helped pick up things um, a little bit. Um 
Do you say no a lot more than you used to? A bit. Okay. A bit. Because I, I thankfully I've been saying no for for a while. <laughs> okay. Um, but but all around, um, just in a whole different variety of aspects of how to talk to clients, approach them, really how to market to clients and attract them in the first place, and and, um, and attract good ones. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess that's definitely something that's progressed mm -hmm. in the last year. And as far as uh, what he was saying about business too, I love photography. I know a lot of times people will, will take a look at my work or they'll ask me what I do and I'll tell them, you know, the kind of shoots that I do and people are like, Oh, that's not very creative or, um, you know, that's not very impressive. I could do that or I could do that with my iPhone. It's just that, uh, I worked with someone before, uh, Jeff Amberg, which we should have on the podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. he reached out to me on social media saying he would love to be on here. We'll see if we can make it work out. Um, but Jeff Amberg is a phenomenal photographer down in Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm sorry if I'm, um, I guess this is, a, I tell the story a lot. So I know this is like episode one, but maybe I've um, mentioned this on another video on my YouTube or something. But, um, one thing he noticed when I was working with him was he said, Hey Jonathan, you're super into photography. You're asking me all the right questions about photography, uh, and editing and that sort and lighting and that sort of thing. But you haven't said a single thing about business. And the truth is back then I didn't think about business yeah. the way I thought about photography in a way, a lot of amateurs or beginners think about photography and being a professional photographer is you just got to have right aura around you. You have to have the, the right quality and then people will just love you for it. Yeah. I, and they'll come and they'll be, easy to work with and they'll be and they'll refer you to all their friends yeah. automatically and definitely everything will just just work out for you the, the the doors will just open yeah that has never been the case for me and it's not the case for 99 percent of the successful photographers i meet exactly you'll find some youtubers that have these stories like oh you know i was i used to work at a camera store and i snapped a few photos and i, and I uploaded them online Next thing you know, you know, Calvin Klein is calling me and they, it's like, that doesn't happen folks. No. Yeah. That's not the real world. Exactly. And that, that's a good point of what you made, like sort of with the iPhones of no iPhones. I mean, obviously we know, and I'm sure most people watching know iPhones can't take photos as good as a true right. camera, but the fact that they can take good photos means there's, there's so good enough. Photos. There's so many good photos out there right. that you have to have the business side too. Right. You can't just put out something with nothing to back it business wise and think that's going to glob on a million mm -hmm. people, a million dollars, and you're going to write it. Because, right, it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. Maybe back, I mean, when film was just starting to really pick up and or digital, no one, yeah, yeah, no one really knew how to uh, get into a darker in themselves and everything, you could get creative with it. And if you mm -hmm. figured out something no one else could, then yeah, your photo alone, someone will recognize it. Yeah, call you to New York, boom, you're famous. But now you have, uh, what is, are, is, is the are there a trillion photos on Who Instagram knows? now? I have no I, idea I, how I'm, many photos are on Instagram. I, I can't imagine. I'm not a huge Instagramer. Like you're the you're the Instagram king here. But just that, ask you a lot just of that about for it. an example, just that yeah. for an example. There's there's so many photos now. You got to have the business side too. Right, and that's what Jeff Amberg was telling me because when he said, he, what he told me is, okay, you, you haven't thought or asked me anything about business. It's all been 100% photography. If you want to make it as a photographer, you have to think 80% business, 20% photography, mm -hmm. which actually I loved Jeff. I really did. But there was like a, a solid week or two where I really didn't like him because he told me that because I, I was really all about the photo. I was, yeah, the I, was I always side. felt like people who, who, who th thought too much about business uh, were really just corrupting the photography uh, and they were the what's wrong with the industry yeah. and and that kind of thing but the more and more I thought it thought about it maybe I considered he was right and I asked him about it and he's like no what I'm saying is you've got to go out or this is this is what I interpreted as him saying you got to go out every day you've got to take the 24 hours you have in a day and devote every single minute 
to being the best photographer you can then be four times better in business yeah like <laughs> so that sounds impossible but that's exactly what you have to do yeah um so it's not that you're lowering your photography in order to be some scam artist yeah it's that no you have to have you've got to be that good at business yeah and i think it's also important to note that it's not like to do photography you have to do that it's to survive as a photographer if you want to be a photographer and truthfully if you just want to go out and take photos we could expand that to, to almost any industry too. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just photography it's any small business any entrepreneur any self-employed person any uh freelancer mm -hmm. graphic design artist plumber electrician whatever yep um all right so tell us then about how you do what you what you do you know you don't have to give away you know the uh, industry secrets necessarily but um what are some of the basics that you feel would be super helpful um that a lot of people don't know about like let's say how did you get to 14,000 followers on instagram what are some of the things that you do when you post that you've got to do because the truth is a lot of people say you know you don't have to hack the algorithms you don't have to do these things i personally believe and hacking the algorithm if you can like <laughs> if you can yeah that's yeah. pretty it's uh, there's definitely no one secret sauce or hack to it but mm. you can definitely set yourself above what most other people are doing um and so really the simplest way to boil it down if you want to just cut all the fat off is the more engaging you are the more engagement comes back to you so the more you post the more i mean just statistically the more likelihood people on that app will see your post the more you comment on other people's posts the more you like other people's posts that's just more chances for your name to be out there for someone else to see your name and come back so that's a really big factor of it there's also other um more technical things you got to make sure you do just like hashtags and tagging people um now Let's not just push over the mo more technical things because that's what a lot of people get confused about. Um, what are, what's this, is there a secret recipe or? Oh, no, it's just making sure you do things like that. Just making those, sure you do it. Yeah, yeah, okay. those are really Kind of like investing. Exactly. Right. There, there's a million people who want to have a million followers and then they put up a photo and they have some very uninteresting caption and one hashtag and that's all. Instagram doesn't cap you on hashtags till 30. So you don't necessarily have to hit 30 every time. I don't certainly every time. But if you want to grow, you got to make sure you post with some hashtags. Right. Same with tagging people. How many hashtags would you say you use on average? Um, probably between 15 and 30. Okay. Um, it, it really just depends. So where, you do you do do hashtags a lot, and how yeah. do you where do you get your hashtags? Is it just from knowing the platform yourself and knowing your audience? At this point, I just literally every single time I post, Copy I just and paste. I no, I just start coming up with what I think is most relevant to the post. Okay, so, so. you still do because a lot of people. Oh yeah, would kind of just there's, get lazy with it. There's like websites where you can look up like top hashtags and stuff, and I did that for a little bit, and it was somewhat effective sometimes it would sort of land me a little bit more engagement than mm -hmm. usual um and then i'm not sure what it was that changed it but those just like plummeted i started getting like one percent two percent engagement on 30 hashtags i'd use okay that's really bad yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i was like all right i'm not i'm gonna stop doing this okay um, so those don't work anymore i guess not yeah yeah and so recently i've just been I just come up with whatever's most relevant. If I'm posting a Mustang, it'll just be Mustang, Mustang GT, Ford, Ford Performance. Do you post a lot about your location uh, as far as, you know, like Greensboro, North Carolina, USA? Not, not whatsoever. Okay. I, I tie every location into some sort of relation to the car or the caption. Just, okay. It's more pleasing to the eye for people. You've got a few brands um, reach out to you as well. Um, what are some of the companies you've worked with? I know you you landed ad uh, ADV one. Okay, um, which is well, very nice. They're uh, yeah they they bought a set for their sub brand Weld Wheels. That's your most recent um, one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's probably uh, the biggest by far. I've worked with a few. 
detail. Um, yeah, a few detail supply companies and done their product photographies and some action shots for them. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. commercially. Um, um, apart from car photography, would you say car photography represents the majority of what you do? Because you do. Um, I've seen a little bit of weddings in your portfolio, yeah. a little, a few people, headshots, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, cars are definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm still open to shooting anything. I still advertise that I shoot anything. Cars are just my biggest market and what I quote unquote specialize in. Um, when I talk to someone, I'll tell them that I specialize in automotive photography, just since that is 90% of my portfolio. Um, but I... They've shot a handful of weddings, uh, headshots. You can certainly shoot weddings. I mean, you've got the talent, so uh, I mean, you know what you're doing. They are stressful. <laughs> I they agree. They are stressful. <laughs> I am not a fan of shooting weddings. I'm not a fan of shooting weddings either. I may end up doing a lot more weddings uh, yeah, actually uh, later. Props just to because. Those who do. But, um, uh, you know, I've shot a few weddings before I've gone more commercial myself. And it's just that... Uh, I was pretty new when I was shooting weddings, but when I started doing commercial, I immediately did not miss weddings just because I realized, man, there are professionals out there who really respect and appreciate what you do, who are ready for shoots when you get there, uh, who you don't have to explain things yeah. over and over and over again to, yeah. uh, who have confidence in your ability and let you give you warm. I mean, I could go on and on about, yeah. reasons I would choose to shoot almost anything else besides wedding. There's it's something just... about that one special day that just factors and into get, so many things. Yeah, oh, and I do get it, that. It makes sense by all means, but right. oh yeah, just everything like that. I've only had um one ever time I lost a whole bunch of data and it was right after <laughs> it was right after a wedding <laughs> and that Did you was, have the uh, father of the bride kind of like uh, that was behind you with a gun absolutely terrifying and it was pro that was actually one of the coolest craziest things i can say that happened with my instagram was i had a pretty big following at the time and i i had a hard drive that just went bad completely lost everything on it there was two or three car shoots and a wedding a full wedding and i was freaking out. I had taken the hard drive to a data recovery specialist. They cracked it open and said the model was so new they had no parts that they could recover from, so they had to wait three months. So it was a new, it was it, a new hard drive a too. Brand That's... new hard drive. It wasn't an SSD though. That was when I learned. Uh, I didn't know about SSDs until SSDs now. SSDs aren't, uh, hor I mean, uh, aren't invulnerable either, but uh... Uh, way less. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, crazy, crazy. So they couldn't recover anything, and I didn't know what to do. And I had posted about it on my Instagram just asking anyone do you know any data recovery specialist do you have any ideas mm -hmm. of what i can do with this specific hard drive that's gone bad and one of my long-term followers who i've never met he's i think in chicago or something like that messaged me and said hey man uh i just had a dream i just woke up from a dream that i had a hard drive with a bunch of photos on it that i lost and i couldn't recover them so i did a deleted data recovery file off my sd card instead of trying to save the hard drive, you should try that. I downloaded a free, it's like reCAPTCHA or something program. Dude, that's I, weird. Hold I, on. Before, I got back Before like, you get to that part, <laughs> let's just rewind this. <laughs> the dream. You had a follower <laughs> tell you about a dream. That he had. This is some like, uh, what's the, did it, did it, did it, what's the, in the in Twilight Zone, Zone oh, stuff. I was thinking Inception. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> some weird... I, I don't know. He had the exact same situation I was in, but thought in to a do dream. something. Yep, in a dream, and thought because he's not. A and it worked in real life. And it worked in real life. I got. I think it was like. A, <laughs> I think I got thirty eight hundred of forty one hundred photos back. <sighs> I was missing a couple like prep shots of of the bride getting ready. And did you ever it. get your car photos back too? No. So you didn't care about the car photos though. Because oh, the weddings, I, you can't I, I cared about them, but not nearly as much as the yeah, wedding. Yeah, because you can't repeat a wedding, right? One, one of those, that was actually pretty bad, though, because one of the car shoots I lost was, it was two one-of-one one cars <sighs> that I drove eight hours to Maryland to shoot. Ah. Uh, uh, thankfully, off of the, like, the teaser photos, I had shown them the owners were so impressed and then upset at the lost photos, they ended up driving to North Carolina to redo the shoot. They drove. Yeah. They're one of one cars. Most most two, people won't put miles on their one of ones I like think that. They trailered them. 
Okay. I think they trailered them. I mean, but they but they still made the drive down here. But it was right. a two one of one GTRs. Um, I love me a GTR. Yeah, yeah and I've kind of grown. Cool. I've grown past my GTR phase though. Now I I feel like Same. I love them for a time, but now I'm getting older. So they have they have their purpose in the world, but yeah, not not my purpose. <laughs> um. Now, where do you think you get most of your business from? Uh, obviously, you're a whole lot on Instagram. If if Instagram's the answer, then it's it's definitely just through Instagram. Now, do you once you have a presence on Instagram, obviously that's how you got your start. Is a lot of that next from word of mouth? Word of mouth. Yep. So at this point, obviously you you still get leads through Instagram. What would you say percentage wise, Instagram versus um, referrals? Um, probably. 60% referrals, 40% someone finds my Instagram. Um, I chalk a lot of that up to the fact that people who I shoot locally refer me to other local people. Right. Whereas I have a bunch of people from all over the country and the world find me on Instagram and they're in no geographic location that I can realistically book something with you them. You could. Well, I, you just have to... Yeah, yeah. Start traveling around, get that brand. Where yeah, you, you know, yeah, I'm an international. A lot of twenty five year olds start going to you know like uh, Dubai and yeah, oh, yeah. shooting some fourteen k, absolutely uh, twenty four karat gold Lamborghinis. You know <laughs> that would be nice. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, Instagram and word of mouth are definitely the biggest. Um, Mustang Week, for example, I went down there with seven shoots booked. And then left with the 13, and the additional ones were all simply word of mouth. Hmm. They were all just other people um, who knew someone else I had shot, figured out I was down there, and wanted to shoot because they, I had been recommended to them. Nice. Um, so, yeah, word of mouth goes yeah, a long way. When you're doing 13 way. shoots in a few days, that's, you know, over $1,000 of photo shoots. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's very good money. Yeah. Especially for a college student. So... Well done on you, sir. Oh, I appreciate that. There are a lot of people who, like I said, who would love to be able to do what you do. Um, hmm. Now, I really agree with the idea that, uh, you know, 40%. I've been on Instagram for a little bit, but I have found personally that in my experience from getting a lot of business through word of mouth. I would say like 90% of my business comes through word of mouth from doing a good job for clients and then referring to other yeah, people. Yeah. And that isn't because I don't advertise or make myself known on social media. I'm actually uh, pretty good at social media online. I've got search engine optimization. I'm on the front page of Google for certain keywords in my area. I really am the, I'm on the front page. Uh, not, um, not because I've got cookies and history yeah, that yeah. shows me, uh, yeah. result, results of our search for that's not it um, and even though you know I get a lot of traffic to my website the majority of my stuff comes through word of mouth I've also been on Instagram and I've pushed Instagram pretty hard but in my experience out of all the ways I try to get leads for my business um, Instagram is the worst quality so I'm I, I know think, that it can work for some people, yeah, I think but it, in my experience... I, I just, think it's very content-specific. Mm -hmm. um, people, car people want to see other cars, and yeah. they, they care about other cars, and they're really interested in other cars. It's, just, it's no different than... I mean, scrolling through Instagram for a car person is no different than going to a car show. You're just going to see a whole bunch of different makes and models and different cars all over, and that's what you want to see. If you primarily shoot things like weddings or commercial spaces that isn't that doesn't really have the same community you know on social media as like the car community on right. social media is huge the the skateboarding community on instagram is huge the drone community on instagram is huge and people are actively taking their time when they're bored when they're sitting on the toilet when they're <laughs> doing whatever they are they Sitting want they want yeah. to see that content uh, wedding photographers. I mean, there's definitely some big ones on Instagram, but I'd say your average wedding photographer is not big on Instagram or pushing it or heavily because the local people that they're shooting, that's not what 
nationwide Instagram people are really interested in. Right, and I agree. And one thing I'd like to kind of point out is, and I know we've had a conversation with this in the past, but what I love about a lot of the emails I get and a lot of the phone calls I get is that when someone calls me who's talked to me or never heard of me, I mean, obviously they heard of me, otherwise they wouldn't email me, but they've never done work with me. They don't know what I offer or anything else. They're just, they just got my information yeah. to call me. They're calling me to book. They're emailing me to book yeah, or to get an estimate because they're ready to shoot and they're just looking for someone who, who, to do the job. Yeah. A lot of the Instagram DMs and everything else I've gotten are, it's just like, it's like very impure raw material that oh, I have to like refine and absolutely. refine and fry. And I found that it's such a waste of time, such a waste of energy. And lots of times I'll post up some great content on Instagram on what I'm doing, uh, sometimes how I'm doing it. And sometimes I just feel like I'm giving business away because I'm, teaching someone who's a wannabe photographer how to do stuff in my industry yeah which is not exactly what i want to do um and i'm not getting any business from it or if i am it's like very little business yeah. and i get plenty of dms from instagram people who are like hey man love your stuff i would love to do a shoot with you and then they i send them a reply yeah pretty quickly yeah you know I, and by quickly i mean a minute or less yeah and they don't respond yeah. or they I, flake out yep. or and I just found that behavior is so unique on Instagram. Yeah. I mean, even Facebook is a bit better. There's You got to do some filtering by all means. Like, I mean, half of my DMs aren't even about bookings. They're just people asking how to do this or where's this location or mm -hmm. what lens do you shoot or what camera do you have? I get right. so many <laughs> things like that, but but I think it just still goes back to so much about what it is, right? What it is you're shooting. I mean, I don't even, I, I, I'm not a bragging point, but I'll, I'll even call myself an Instagram photographer because that's what I'm shooting for most yeah, of I would the time. Not, I would not consider that a flex. No, exactly. No, it's not really <laughs> a flex, but it's where I get business and it's what it's people like, want. So right. I, a lot of my business is people who have a personal car that did something new to it or they got a new car and they want to show it off on social mm -hmm. media and I take photos that look good on social media. And so that's why they book me. Yeah. Whereas someone who is selling a house or someone, someone who's just scrolling through Instagram is probably not thinking about selling their house or who's going to shoot the photos for their house or anything like that. Whereas they see a bright flashy image of a car that's the same model they own. All of a sudden they think I want that guy to shoot my car. Right. So they see it there. They want it there. I'm there. They book me there. Whereas for something like commercial photography, that's just not where the right. market is spending their time. Like, mm -hmm. so it's a, it, it's a, it, there's pros and cons. There's, there's definitely pros and cons. There's definitely it, yeah. pros and cons. Like you said, I do, I do a lot of filtering. There's a lot of BS. Yeah. I just, I guess, um, the leads I generate are so good at this point. Yeah. Dealing with Instagram for me is just like, uh, Oh, and that's another thing too with real estate is a listing comes and then it goes yeah. and then it's gone right. forever. Whereas even if I'm shooting the same client, it's car at one point it's this color and then it has this wheels and then it's lowered and now it's a new color and then new wheels. Right. And so it's something that's a progression good, good. and goes through now. But, um, Speaking of Instagram stuff, and I don't mean to burn Instagram here. I nah. just, I just really am. I'm actually trying to help a lot of people because a lot of photographers who want to get legit, if you will, um, with their photography, will go to Instagram and they'll spend a lot of time there, and they're surprised <laughs> because they'll have a lot of people who, and they get discouraged because they have a lot of people who flake. Yeah. By flaking, I mean they'll act like they want to shoot. They'll even schedule something for you and bail. Um, or they'll not get that much attention or they'll they'll get a lot of attention, but they won't convert into a paying client, mm -hmm. which is what you need to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that's actually incredibly common. <laughs> um, in fact, we had a conversation, one of the first conversations we ever had together and not mentioning anyone in particular, but we'll just talk about people in general. 
Yeah. People who have like a hundred K subscribers. Yeah. Who scrape by. Who scrape by people that's that's another very, very simple way to boil it down is people think followers convert to money and it doesn't. Yeah. Yes, it can convert to business. By all means, it can convert to business. What do you mean by it can convert if, to money, but it, it, but it can you you will get business from it. What do you call business? Because traffic, you're recognized. You want people who want to book you, everything. But because what I would know, call business, if you don't know how to turn it into money, I mean, if you have a hundred k, you're gonna have someone asking you for a shoot multiple times a week. If you yeah. don't know how to convince any one of those people how to pay you more than seventy five dollars, you're not making money. We'll see. I wouldn't call that business. I would call that a waste of my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, cause business to me is like, Hey, let's sit down and have an exchange of goods and services. Oh yeah. Right. It, it, that, well, that's, and then, that's, that's you know, one, somebody's getting paid and that's people's 80, 20 mindset of business versus photography. Right. You have and then the business side other too. people are just posing. Oh or, yeah. Or exactly. pin- and you, you told me specifically about some people who, had over a hundred K subscribers, maybe even more. They were shooting, uh, super rare cars. They were shooting, shooting like billionaires in their private jets. And they were making around $10,000 or less a year. It was 20, but 20, still thousand yeah. dollars less a year. I mean, yeah. you can't survive no. off that. No, it's, and the saddest part no. is you're obviously surrounded by money and mm-hmm. uh, not you, but some of these people, we're not converting it into money. Don't know how to, yeah. And the reason Don't is, to cut a long story short, and what we were discussing is because they're so concerned with getting likes and tags and followers that they're willing to shoot it for free. For free, yeah. And when we had this conversation, I can still remember it, it was before the pandemic and everything, we were sitting in Chick-fil-A, and I had to get up from the table and like walk outside <laughs> and just come back and be like, you're telling me these people have gotten access to this client pool that would drop 10 grand in a second to have someone wrap their car. Mm-hmm. Right. But they don't know how to prove their value as a photographer. But they're too afraid to say no if they refuse to pay. Yeah. It's it's common. Like, it's incredibly common. And after I saw that, I was like, it, this has to be unique. This has to be just North Carolina. This just has to be Charlotte and Greensboro area. Then I started getting on Facebook groups like car photography, automotive professional photography, and all these things. And I see it just infuriated me. People doing Facebook Lives on their cell phone, talking about how to do automotive photography, how to do car photography, and saying, hey, I've been doing car photography for two years. I still shoot for free. Yeah. And I take a look at their work because you can like kind of stalk people on Facebook yeah. by clicking on their profile and seeing them as they're doing a live. And it looks like I'm not going to rag on these people because they actually do good yeah. work. Yeah. They're just giving it away for free uh-huh. because they – they just fold at the the first sign of awkward conversation, yeah. uh, a potential, you know, <sighs> uncomfortable price quote yeah. that they're just too afraid to give. So the truth is, when they're when people are having the situation, it's nobody's fault. It's not the industry's fault. It's not the customer's fault. It's the photographer's <laughs> fault. It's not professional photographers. It's not amateur photographers. Yeah. It's their own fault for being in that situation and still not. It's because they don't have the skills. They they don't have the guts yeah. to demand what they're worth. Yeah. And the truth is, it's like, oh, well, you know, like you've told me some DMs you've gotten that <laughs> – is just incredibly entitled like hey man uh got this really nice you know limited edition uh, yeah. car of some kind all if you want to shoot it i'll let you yeah all the time it'll be I, I will have never seen this person in my life i don't even follow them and they'll reach out to me first and say like hey man if you ever want to shoot my car like 
you're more than down. Like, feel free. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I hear my rights. Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, where did you come from? <laughs> yeah, and, and they're kind of insinuating, like, oh, absolutely. I'll let you. Yeah. Right. No, Sometimes I'll just say it straight out. No, that's what, yeah, that's what they'll say. They'll be like, yeah, if you ever want to shoot my car, like, I'll let you do it. Just let me know. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, and it's some it's some it's 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 crazy because uh, I I mean I deal with a little bit of that, but if I were to tell another one of my clients about that situation, my client would be mad for me. Yeah, like how dare give me their name? I want it's, names, you know, so that you can just dox them online and have the whole Twitter mob after that. Not really, it's, but it's uh, such an interesting concept. But I I, I I don't know, like I don't know what. How how you could relate it to something else, but it's just it's so inconceivable that people just the thing is it's just the problem with it is that you have so many people who want to be photographers so bad yeah yeah but don't know the first thing about business it's it's like literally walking into a McDonald's and just like telling the people behind the counter like hey like do you know who I am like like you want to make me a burger you can <laughs> like you can like. All right, you make me burn and expecting it, like so expecting get, them to want to. <laughs> so let's like, get to brass tacks here. You want? Hey, there's some people who who do that. You know, I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, especially pretty people. You know, like, <laughs> hey, I had a friend like that growing up. The sad thing is, he would he was so good at flirting, he would literally get free movie tickets almost every time I went to the movies because <laughs> he didn't want to pay movies. And that, and I'm not kidding you there. Uh, he Save had some, some swag about him. Anyway, some swagger. But um, getting down to brass tacks here, what's the difference between you, someone who gets 13 paid shoots in a few days, versus someone who's been doing photography at good quality for two years shooting for free? You put it, you said it pretty much earlier, it's just learning how to say no, <laughs> standing your ground. Okay. I mean, I, 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 get, I get as many people who aren't willing to pay me as someone who's been shooting for two years and never offered, never tried to charge before. Like there's a million people who don't want to pay me, but I just say no, or <laughs> I'm not going to, or yeah. I give them my rates and that's that. And now, uh, to quell some of the fears out there, when you stand up for yourself, how often does it convert to a paying, uh, a paying customer? It's hard to say. All around, probably 50-50. Okay, 50-50 is pretty um, good. Yeah, probably 50-50. Um, the ones that do might take a little bit of convincing. Usually they'll hear my rates. and then That's just sales. They'll be yeah. apprehensive, and then they'll ask something like how many edits they're going to get back. And once they find out they're not getting five, then they don't bother anymore. But mm -hmm. you get a ton of people who you mentioned – rates or payment too and then they just disappear <laughs> never come back but uh occasionally you get the people that try and argue with you and you know the oh well my brother my buddy will shoot it for free it's like okay yeah, go, go, go do, do it. it then you asked me to shoot it not not them there's probably a reason for that yeah there's and, a there's a big reason why people uh i see this all the time on like reddit groups and uh uh, Facebook groups where people are like, you know, they're professional yeah. photography groups and a photographer will post up, Hey, uh, here's a text cap of me and a client. And, um, the text is essentially saying, yeah, well, I don't understand why you charge that much when I can get another photographer for doing for half or free. Right. And it's just like, people don't realize that. Okay. If they could, why would they why, be calling you? Yeah, why why didn't you go do that to begin with? There's really? a reason they're calling you. I, and it's I mean, people re I, some reasons that people don't think of is one, maybe they have shot with that photographer before and they aren't as good as they seem to be. Yeah. Or they don't deliver the images fast enough or they're absolute jerks to deal with, like super pain. Yeah. I I personally have a competitor in my local area who's so rude to his clients. Like, there was a year where he was so rude. I'm not sure if he was going through a mental issue or what. 
but probably the 25 to 50 percent of the leads I got that year were for some for, for, from clients who n- stopped using him because he made Weird. like he were he was making people cry on the shoot. Literally, two clients of mine said, "Yeah, my last photographer made my client cry. I need to find a new photographer." I don't know if I've made that many people cry in my entire life. <laughs> How, uh, what do you do to do that? You're not that? married yet. No, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just like <laughs> I don't even know how you just walk into someone's house like, "Yo, this is like I like your house is terrible." <laughs> no, I, don't know. I don't know what don't, you can do. I, I don't know what can possess you to make multiple to be in cry. any situation where. At the in, at the outcome of that situation, someone's that's walking away that's, crying. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. But uh, so anyway, getting back to the point it, is, people need to realize there may be someone offering to do it for yeah. seventy bucks or or less or nothing. I don't know. The point is, let them go if they want to use that. Mm-hmm. Let them go. But you don't. Like. Yeah, exactly. Like they don't offer you. Plus, here's another thing that people are like are going to be surprised that people don't. I th- I don't think usually think of <clears throat> that photographer might not exist at, at all. all. They're just lying mm-hmm. to you. They're bluffing in order to see if you can lower your price or do it for free. Yes, people do this. I love it. I had someone speaking of DMs. I had someone DM me the other day, asked my rates for a shoot. They said all good, and then asked if I would lower my price to give them all the raws and let their photographer mom edit them. <laughs> like that's the more expensive option, not the least letter service option. I've had clients, what? I have had clients try to negotiate, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, woo, negotiate me down. And I know for a fact what some of my competitors prices are. Yeah. And they'll tell me, yeah, well, I know that your competitor only charges this much. And I'm like, Okay, well, I know you're lying. Yeah. You know, I don't tell them that I know they're lying, but I know they're lying because I know what my competitor charges, and he doesn't charge that much. Yeah, so it, there's some weird stigma with just people in the world and and arts nowadays that there's no value on it. Even when I think it's so funny that like someone else can literally have something, offer something, the talent of something that you do not have, mm-hmm. and yet you can't put it there's no valuation on it for him like you can't cook yourself a five-star steak so you go to a steakhouse and you pay someone to cook it you can't align the tires on your car so you go to a shop for someone that has the equipment to do it you can't take photos like this someone else knows how and has the equipment but paying them is just yeah I, there's, I, it's there's something absolutely a stigma where i saw it first you don't pay photographers. i saw it was the best example i've ever seen uh, not too long ago, I was, I was, I'll, I'll leave out as many details as I can. Um, I was with someone who, who does car drawings, like the very, very detailed, almost looks like a photo car drawings. They spend 20 to 15 to 20 hours per drawing. Yeah. And they were with me shooting a car. Um, I'm shooting the car and I'm telling the client, Hey man, these are gorgeous. They're going to make some great prints if you want anything. Um, it's my friend who does the drawings. And so I said, Oh, he, does drawings too yeah Um, if you wanted one of one of these photos it'd be awesome and the car owner was like oh let me uh let me look at some of your drawings the guy pulls up his page pulls up his drawings and the owner was just blown away he was like holy crap man these are amazing like i have never like my sister draws some cars but then nothing looks anything like this like these are so good i have never seen this before how much for a drawing and guy goes out uh Start at 250 for a eight by 10. Yeah. And the car owner goes, well, what about a family and friends discount? <laughs> and, and I, I bit my tongue cause he's my client, but I was just like, you just met this guy. You are neither a friend or family. Like you, you literally just saw something and reacted so genuinely. You could not hide how much you, you liked that product had never seen it before and want it as soon as you hear a price tag now it's got to be less yeah and i guarantee you uh, uh this guy would not think twice about dropping five grand on some modification for his car either i'm sure i'm uh, sure yeah it's, and, I, and it's, i understand you know i understand i love cars too i've got obviously absolutely. some cars in the back of me behind right now but 
Um, I, and I'm, I'm not expecting anyone to pay right. me ten grand for a two hour photo shoot of their right. car, but like the fact that some of these people just automatically think it has to be zero dollars or nothing because it's something artistic, like it just blows my mind. Right. It blows my mind. But uh but I just want to get it out there that yeah. um listen folks, if you do not look out for yourself and demand value for yourself, nobody else will. Just stay in your ground. That's that's yeah. yeah. And the industry is not going to help you. The uh, YouTubers aren't going to help you. I'm not going to help you. You've got to be able to walk into a situation yourself. No, believe that you're worth it, first of all, which is one thing. But even if you don't believe that you're worth it, you've got to stand your ground and say, hey, I really appreciate you uh, being nice about it. Ab- and that's ab- another thing. I was going to say. You don't get an argument. put that it's, on. It's kind of like judo always where you take, you take their attack yeah. and you just roll their energy. You use their momentum mm-hmm. and politely turn it right back yeah. at them. Never get uh, into some Instagram, Twitter, DM battle with anyone. That, that, that especially because they'll screen cap it. Exa- like, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, even if you're in the right or think you're in the right, it's never worth and it. And it's just, amazing the types of manipu- the, the, the manipulative tactics and the, the like outright hostage like they'll try to hold your reputation your reputation hostage uh, uh what do they what do they call that when they uh just um try to like destroy your character what libel or slander yeah just yeah they'll yeah. threaten slander all yeah. sorts of stuff it, just to try to get you to do free work and it's like yeah i run an airb uh excuse me a short-term rental like a vacation rental as well and it is absolutely wild some of the times when people say, hey, I see in your rules, you don't allow pets or you don't allow but events. Um, you, you're you willing to make an exception for me. They have, have like pet no event. reviews. They just joined. <laughs> it's just like, hey, I really appreciate it, but no, I can't do that. And then they're, they get mad Yeah. when it's, you say no. I, I don't know what goes in the people's head because that goes back to like bring it into a, a normal everyday business. Like are you just going to go fill up your grocery cart with stuff and go to checkout and just I, I'm 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 feeling a senior discount today. Like, well, <laughs> sir, sir, you're 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 in your mid twenties, but, <laughs> but you can help me out though, right? You We're can friends. help me out. Hey, what's though, your name? Right? What's your name? Yeah, Jessica. Exactly. Friends and family friends, discount, right? <laughs> right? Like I, you don't same thing. You don't break your car or go in to get an oil change and just expect it for free or a discount off the blue. Like I don't know what it is about certain. Certain industries, but but just working around them is all you can do. Yep, the, they'll the, always be there. Yeah, you just yeah, you're gonna have to say um, all this to point out that it's normal. Yep, it's common, mm-hmm. and it's not going anywhere. So if you want to be a professional photographer, exactly, and you it's can do be fine. something you have to deal with. You can do fine with it still being around. Yeah, you can work around them. Um, all right, now that we've thoroughly explored that topic, um, what are some other things? you think uh you know you'd really like to speak about while we're here that's like the main thing i wanted to talk Man, about i i'm i was telling you beforehand i'm not all that interesting i, <laughs> I take people ask what i do i take photos of cars you take really cool i do photos of cars i mean is, people can say i mean have you ever heard that uh the thing where it's like explain like in the most boring way what you do for a living like <laughs> don't try yeah. to play yourself down like you do really cool stuff. Uh, you, you're about to get a. You were in a wreck recently, which is what you, oh, you, know, you yeah, got scars. It was, it was in a um, wreck recently. What car are you going looking at and getting? Obviously, you had to say goodbye to the Ford uh, Focus, uh, the Fiesta, the I was fo- below a Focus. <laughs> It was below a focus. It wasn't like the. I was in the. It was my grandfather. He's uh, 94 and can't drive anymore. Well, you had a Panther before that. Yeah, I did. I did have a Grand Marquis. This is pretty. Um, but I'm my, so glad you sold that because I had this guy rolling up when he was doing some shoots for me to my clients, and my clients would talk like, I had one client literally call me and be like, "Hey, um, I really like your assistant, but." Uh, I wasn't very comfortable, and I couldn't get him to admit why, <laughs> but I knew it was your car, dude. I That thing looked shady AF. Yeah, well, it, look, it looked like a drug dealer. <laughs> That's the only way of putting it. I loved it, though. I loved it. It was parked outside of my uh, family friend's house back in uh, yeah. Raleigh one time in a very, very fancy like golf course neighborhood, and we were all having oh, dinner, gosh. and 
their neighbor across the street texted them and were like, hey, are you guys okay? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know if you know about the car out front. <laughs> the first time you pulled up with my house, I was a little bit like, ooh, because I was so impressed with you over the phone. You sent me your portfolio, and I was like, oh, oh. man, this is the guy. And then when you pulled up in that car, I was like, <gasps> oh, the driver did not fit the no, the driver did, did not, not fit the uh, car. Uh, fit the but, car, but, but I, was I was in the I was in the Fiesta for a little bit, and my yeah, my grandfather's ninety four, can't drive anymore. He had like an eighties Corolla that finally died, and he was getting a new car, and he was so mad because he did not want to spend any money on a car at all, just yeah. coming from his Great Depression era, and his, one of his stigmas was he didn't want he didn't want any car that had power windows, had to have. So the, windows. You're talking about. I didn't know this. Your Ford Fiesta didn't have power windows. No, it did because he couldn't find a single new car with okay. windows. I was gonna say, but <laughs> but with that whole mindset that he he picked the Fiesta I was in with right. that mindset. So it was it had no cruise control. You couldn't lock the brights on, which so seems, you had to hold the brights. You had to hold the brights if you wanted the brights on. There's just like two speakers. That doesn't cost thing. any extra money. It's just. At, uh, right. It's just a switch that just uh, literally a latch that would hold it. But yeah, that thing was absolute base of the base. I will say, I I like it more after the crash. I always I always crapped <laughs> on that dead. thing. You don't have you don't know what you have until it's gone. It, it, it's hatchback. Not, not even that. It just it was way safer than I thought. That thing had way more airbags than I thought. Yeah, for people who don't know, uh, I drive a WRX hatchback. I used to not drive a hatchback. Now that I've gone five door. I'll probably never go back, especially for daily I'm driver. Going hatch again. Yes, it's not an interesting one. It's but the it is way. A hatch. No, it is. If you're doing a daily driver, if you can get something with a little bit of umph to it, that's great. But uh, yeah, man, there's, there's no umph in the new car. <laughs> but it, but it's a hatch. Right. Um, Did I, t- I don't know if I told you. It's a. I'm getting the HRV, a Honda HRV. Yeah, you're yeah. deciding between the Impreza and yeah. the HRV. Yeah. Honda's good. Honda's really good. Yeah. You'll, yeah, that uh, the, the Impreza. I would the only loved problem it. you'll have with a Honda is that you're not going to get another car for a long time. Ever, ever. <laughs> I le- I just learned something very interesting about Honda, which is obviously the the job of the salesman to spit out things that sound good. But I did not know the Honda dealer told me Honda does not sell to anything commercially. They only sell privately. You can that. only buy Hondas as a private consumer or a small business. They have no fleet vehicles. Were you on you, were you on uh Wendover at the Honda? No, I was okay. in the one in back in Cuz I know I know a salesman you But uh he just to. pointed out little things like even the absolute base of the base models, base of the base trim, I'm getting cloth seats, base of the base, your dash, your armrests, your steering wheel and your center console are always leather. Just like little things that you touch, you're just because they don't have to chunk out twenty thousand enterprise rentals. So Toyota and Ford and Chevy get these Fiestas and Yaris's and Chevy mm. Sparks that are just like the absolute worst plastic. Everything's yeah. terrible. And so I mean, it's not much. It's still a twenty. It's still done. a twenty thousand dollar Honda. It's not. Right new off the lot it's not a fancy car but just like there's little things i didn't i never realized though that honda has no fleet vehicles i've always liked honda i've got a a friend one time who had a honda element and we were removing some stuff for him and uh, i was surprised how many things we could fit in that honda element <laughs> and all the secret compartments the H- element has have. tons of compartments yeah it's just tons like compartments they they remove the floors yeah. and there's like an and extra foot isn't of that space. the one that had like the the plastic floors and everything yeah, yeah. so that it could just never get dirty you right just like right hose the whole thing yeah. out yeah how do you clean That's my car awesome. by the way um <laughs> yeah hmm. i would have loved that impressive though but the actually really the only thing that turned me off of it uh happened to be the history of the car and my history with detailing. You know, I worked at a very high yeah. end detail shop right. and this had a very minor accident on the report. And so not nothing about it, whatever. But I asked the guy the details of the accident and he said it was a very, very minor accident. It got bumped and there was a scratch on the bumper. So they replaced the bumper. And as soon as he said that, I was like, they replaced the bumper. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, that's, seems a bit extreme he was like no they just wanted to be sure so they replaced it and i was like well i i worked at a shop where we fixed that and if you had a scratch you fix the scratch yeah for a hundred dollars you didn't replace the bumper what that sounds like to me is the bumper got hit hard enough to get cracked right 
So no, people will lie to I'm, you too. Oh, absolutely. Plus, here's the absolutely. thing: when you're negotiating With on a car, because you know I used to sell cars. Yeah. Um, did you have haggle prices? All these dealers now are moving away from it. Honda just told us that they have. They're not doing any sort of haggling anymore on any used cars. They still want new. It's probably because consumers have. It's in the last six months. They said they went to one price. There's and nothing def- else. There was definitely haggling. There's so much haggling. Oh, the whole, yeah, I the guess whole people street are going away from it. Yeah. Uh, well, the problem is people are probably so sick of the dirty <laughs> trash dealerships do. That's what you told me. And I can tell you plenty of stories. In fact, I will when we have Basilio on because Basilio is coming on. Um, he uh, worked at a car dealership with me. Um, actually, trained me how to sell cars and stuff, which I'll was be interested to hear that. One. He's a really good guy. Yeah. But the store we were at was probably your average car dealership. Yeah. But man, they pulled some nonsense. Oh, I'm sure. But when you're negotiating <laughs> with that, uh, a great point to hold is like, I don't care how bad the damage was; it's on the Carfax. Yeah. Oh, so exactly. if I ever tried to resell this, yeah, it would ruin the resale uh-huh. value. Uh-huh. So as, I'm not yeah, paying that as was much. Thing for too. It. I was like, if it was a light scratch, that doesn't really show up on Carfax either. Like, yeah. there's no reason to report a light bump and right. a scratch to Carfax. Right. But all said and done, we'll be in another hatch. <sighs> yep. Now um, you're graduating this semester in December. December. Yes. Then uh, after that, you plan on working with me for. We'll see. You're welcome to stay as long as you while. like. We'll be happy to have you. Yeah. Then you want to move out west. Out west. If it's still there. If it hasn't burned up entirely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, um, uh, man. But you know me. Well, I know you're against heat, too. We you hey. love the cold. Is that my computer? I think so. Okay. Love the, love the cold. Um, Snowboarding is great. My little brother in Denver, they got three inches of snow. Wow. Yeah, like a week ago. Gosh. It's back up to like 60 now, but still. like. Yeah. We're not getting snow. I have no idea what my computer's doing. I don't know. That is that Discord? Probably Discord. Anyway. Um, but yeah, gosh. If, if it hasn't burned up, it's a plan on going Colorado or Utah, I think. Do you have any tips on um, your editing process? Do you do a whole lot of editing in post, or do you get a lot in camera oh, done right? Oh, it's... Oh my it's post. post. It's post. Yeah? It's post. That's the way I used to I mean, my, my photos are... Let me hold on. Let me yeah, take care of this. Good. You're good. Watching some uh, Edward um, Snowden on Joe Rogan on my computer. I mean, my the the raws aren't bad by any means. Yeah, they they're it's the raws you'll get from a DSLR. They look better than an iPhone and stuff. But the amount that I that goes into post, there's a lot that goes into. I've post. seen your before and afters. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's one in particular shot that I was really impressed by, where you took a shot. I think of a BMW. I love BMWs, and uh, there was a freeway. You took it underneath a freeway oh. bridge, and the and the bridge was kind of curving. Ha- Kind of in the middle of the photo. Yeah, that was a Mustang left. shot. So, yeah. oh, the Mustang shot. Yeah, that was, that well, was, I remember that was the, I remember the road. Sorry, I'm not a fan of Mustangs. <laughs> like, I know a lot of Mustang people are out there, and you're like, oh, you'll alienate your audience. I don't want anyone with a Ford watching my. If you wouldn't excuse Mustang, me, a Mustang watching my. If you wouldn't a Mustang, week, I think your opinion would vary slightly. They're, they're, they're tough. No, fun. I'll tell you why. Because I would have also met the drivers, and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah you like my no, Mustang? They're awesome. They're awesome. <laughs> I stayed just, at I stayed at a house because... with all Baltimore guys. They're very. I think I think it's more North Carolina Mustang drivers than it is Mustang and drivers. South Carolina Mustang drivers. Okay, and South Carolina. Maybe, <laughs> but no. I have I have been. You know, I lived in Europe. The domestic like American cars are pretty rare in Europe. Yeah, but there yeah. was a few Mustangs that I that I saw. Mustang drivers in Europe are the same ones that we have over here in South Carolina, North Carolina, <laughs> oh, dude. Good old boys. <laughs> <laughs> love it Absolutely but uh love it. but um, the uh where i mirrored the yeah the so, you, shot. so you yeah so you just mirror the freeway and it meant yeah perfectly yeah. symmetrical shot is um, gorgeous just try layer stuff like that uh it just sort of learned what people like what they don't i had edited the whole photo with one with the freeway going over it and i thought that looks pretty good what and are some like, things oh. you would say are must edits that you've got to do that people expect in an automotive photograph like like specific shots or like things I know, to do two edits like i know like for example you don't want reflections in the window yeah. so you use a circular polarizer yeah right a, a cpl is an absolute must you okay. cannot shoot a car what, without like a cpl so if you were shooting real estate like i would 
like I would tell you, I'm like, man, you got to get your vertical straight, right? Yeah. That's our industry expectations. Absolutely. What are some industry else. expectations for cars? Hmm. Um, this, I wouldn't even say, uh, it's hard to say industry expectations. Because like the there's CPL a lot is of, a must. Because there's a lot of people, because I mean, if the clients are setting the expectations, then a lot of clients have pretty low expectations. Right. What I would say, but I know, I know the point you're trying to make of what is what is a must to make something look good. Mm-hmm. I would say a uh, a CPL. Um, that that's what it was. Is color accuracy? Mm. A, a lot of photographers, a lot of people will hire photographers to do good work, and it is clean, and there's good light, and there's good contrast and there you have good foreground elements and everything but it bothers me so much when you don't accurately depict the color of the car yeah and so i haven't had i mean a few people have mentioned it i i'm not gonna attest my following or success shooting cars to that but that's something i have always stick by very very strictly and i think it's done me quite well right of whatever you're doing shoot it at sunset shoot it broad daylight shoot it cloudy nighttime whatever but make the paint look as accurate as you can to the paint in Absolutely. real life um so cpl you, do, you, do you use a gray card no yeah i, I no. find the auto white balance is um, just fine yeah and i just would do things like i I'll, I'll scroll through the instagram of the car or i'll look at my cell phone shots of it and just get like as accurate of a color in my head as I can right. remember to what it was. Now, do um, you ever use HDR systems or anything like that? Um, rarely. I'm usually a one exposure mm-hmm. shot. Uh, there are certain cars or locations where, or situations. Yeah. yeah, where the reflections are just so bad, or someone's paint is just so bad. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll shoot a black car where, where if it's a black car in direct sun, where anything where the polarizer catches right looks jet black, and then where the sun is hitting or something, it just it literally looks like someone spray painted a spider web, like uh, just everything. And so then I will um, get out the tripod and I'll do multiple exposures with the CPL when mm-hmm. I'll HDR them or overlay them or something like that. Do you use external lighting at all, or are you all natural light? All natural available light. Um, yeah. I have done some artificial stuff and I want to get more into it. Um, it's becoming more and more popular, mm-hmm. uh, especially around here. There's some guys. You can really get some cool more more, shots. Yeah. I know. I, I think I've introduced you. What was his name? Lars Jepsen. Yeah. Um, yeah. He does some really cool stuff with external lighting and yeah, he did a lot of commercial work. Really high-end. cool stuff. So I, I definitely want to get into he that. He shot for that soon. race car driver who lives locally. What's his name? The guy with the mustache. Richard Petty. Richard Petty. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm not a big NASCAR guy I'm, or, I'm or not, sports guy. I'm not either. I have shot for a NASCAR driver, though. Really? Who's, I, uh, is it okay he, to say? Oh, yeah. Cody Shane Ware. Okay. He's not like a super, well super top of the, yeah, top known guy, but uh, I shot his uh, sports bike. Okay. Him, so that was cool. Another cool thing. What I got other to stories do. do you have that you forget in your boring, <laughs> oh, so boring the shooting for NASCAR and, you know. Lamborghini one of ones and you know is this anything anyone else ever any does? Like honestly, I'll be going Jeez. to do my shoots some days and then I'll then I'll open up my Instagram and I'll be like, oh look, uh, JSP Auto up, updated a story. Don't you want to see? So I'm like, sure, oh, I'm bored and I'll look it up. You know, like shooting Ferraris <laughs> and I look at what I'm shooting and it's like speaking single of, wide. Yeah, speaking of tomorrow, <laughs> what are you shooting? Two Ferraris. <laughs> <laughs> you jerk. Oh my! Oh, thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah. Okay. What that. time, by the way? Uh, sometime in the afternoon, evening. Okay. Later afternoon, evening. The guy's real flexible. Um, All right. So he said, just let me know when when I'm done. But we'll try to get our work done then. Two uh, black, two black Ferraris. So that should be cool. Very I'm nice. excited. They're not red. Um, love red Ferraris. In- interesting fact: red does not do well on Instagram. Interesting. Uh, I know Ferrari. Um, sorry. Um, at Foreign Cars Italia, I was speaking with him one time. No, I was no, I was just in the, <laughs> I was just in the showroom because I like looking at cars yeah. there sometimes. Oh, I get And it uh, one of the executives or one of the managers was just furious with one of the employees because they had ordered a yellow Ferrari. Huh. And they were pissed because they're like, like they're using all all types of 
curse words like really loud for everyone in the showroom to hear like he was just chewing them out purely to embarrass them it's like why the heck did you order a yellow ferrari yellow is a lamborghini color i bet you I know idiot who, but i know who the salesman was too <laughs> I know a salesman there who has specced just the craziest. He never does red Ferrari. Like <laughs> he got there's one coming in that's like matte black with green carbon and stuff. Interesting. Yeah, he goes crazy. That was probably the guy that got yelled at. That's funny. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll buy a yellow Ferrari either. Now that I think about it, is this like I, I saw a white, they have a white Ferrari out in front right now on their little. It looks. I nice. like Ferraris in almost everything but red. Not Ferraris I, are growing on me. Red. Um, I just there's so many red ones. Oh, well, this will this will be controversial for your following. Uh, what's your favorite car? <laughs> He's like, can I say this or do I have to be well, play neutral? Well, favorite car can go a lot of ways. Just outright favorite car out of anything. Okay, a hundred grand or less. Hundred. Oh God. What would you What would you buy? Hundred grand or less. I'm buying. That's gonna be a C63 AMG. Okay. Mercedes. Mercedes. Yeah. Okay. Love AMG. What the fuck that? The uh, new ones, man. I tell you, factory boosted cars are terrifying because of the extra power you can get out of them. Right. They limit them so much, and so you can go pick up a eighty-five thousand dollar C63 sedan, four doors, put your family in the back. Do downpipes, exhaust, tune. You're putting like 660 to the wheel. Golly. We are living in an interesting time, too, because it just seems like you can't really buy a bad car because because no, all of the things Power is so accessible. Out. I just saw something posted yesterday. It was like a dealer tag of a uh, Charger Hellcat that was doing 96-month financing at 28%. And it was, I'm just, they're just, whoever walks in and says, I'll give you $20 a month is going to get 707 horsepower. Cause that's what that, no, I mean, 28%, 96 months. I don't even, I don't even know how that's possible. I lie. mean, that was, that was, that's, that's an unheard though. of. I don't know what lender would lend that. I, I don't know. And it was 28%, 28% interest. APR. Annual percentage rate twenty eight percent ninety six a month. <laughs> You're paying for that car four but, times, but that, maybe five times at least. This is why Mustang <sighs> drivers have the stigma of crashing now, and you see so many Challengers and Chargers crash and stuff. Idiots because can because, because it's they're offering these crazy financing to, with with modern power. I mean, twenty twenty muscle cars are putting out six hundred plus to the wheel. Now you got these dealers that are financing them for a couple hundred bucks a month to any Joe schmuck that comes in. <laughs> of course, there's going to be a lot of crashes. Yeah. Yeah. When any 22 year old is oh able to finance gosh. a brand new Mustang GT, they're going to crash it. Yeah. It's, oh. it's, it, we live in a crazy time. We live in a crazy time. I'm really excited for the uh, Tesla Roadster 2. Yeah. That's, that's gonna going be. to be. Is there any update on timeline with that? No, Elon Musk, you know, bless his heart, he's uh, a lot going on. He's got a lot of stuff going on. Plus, he he kind of recognizes what's good. He does think of like the greater good, and he's prioritizing the truck because he, he feels like that's gonna more needed for the people, more needed for the earth. Yeah, kind of oh, by all means. Dumb reason, in my opinion, but uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it's I, a good reason. I think you'll yeah you'll do you'll do more for the earth, replacing every. Truck. Iron block pickup. But it's really interesting will, seeing how many other car manufacturers too are bringing out electric vehicles. I mean, I keep you seeing like to. you can't compete now. Yeah, gotta have it. Man, mm. it's, it's crazy. All right. Well, uh, I think if you don't have anything else to th to uh, say, we'll hopefully all the audio works out and uh, nothing went wrong with the uh, video. Yeah. And uh, we can get this uploaded. I didn't hear a click. Yeah. <laughs> So we got so it good. done in, in one uh, in one go here. All right. Well, uh, if you want to go ahead and throw out some, um, you know, I guess uh, what do you call it? Uh, promote yourself Promo. here. Promo. Uh, yeah, James Stevens Photography. Um, James Stevens Photography dot com on Instagram. I'm just JSP Auto. My drone page is JSP FPV. Both of those have an underscore after the JSP. Um, check me out. I hope you like cars. Uh, a lot of car content, a lot of cool cars. 
All right. Yeah. Dude, thank you for having me yeah, on. Thank uh, you. Or excuse me. I guess thank you for coming. Sorry, uh, yeah. I'm not no. on the podcast here. <laughs> well, thank you for having uh, me on. And uh, if you guys have any questions about it or uh, if you want have some ideas, this is episode one. I will be responding to everybody's comments down below. I'll also be um, posting this stuff onto a lot of places that I think don't have comments. But I'll, I'll try to reply to whatever you have. Uh, if you have any ideas, feel free to uh, share those ideas and uh, also don't forget to you know like, subscribe, follow whatever platform you're on. We are going to be doing this hopefully weekly um, with new guests. We'll have you know some new guests, but also some repeat guests over the years. Oh, yeah. um, I would love to come check in in a while. So uh, just like, comment, subscribe, follow. Do all that, and uh, thank you for watching the first episode of The Photographer's Underground. All right. Thanks, man. Awesome.